it's actually my first event uh, after pandemic, so it's it's great to to get out and 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 be here. So let's see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> so and I hope there will be many more to follow. Definitely uh, interesting events. So uh, what I wanted to talk about is. Uh, essentially has one direction and that is how can we make Scala a really simple language and environment. So simplicity. Simply Scala is the title of the talk. And uh, I want to start with it that I really believe that Scala is a very clean and simple language. I think that's why most of you actually also got into Scala and uh, uh, liked the language. So it, it is clean and simple and I think it got more so with the transition to Scala 3. So most languages get larger and more complicated over time. And I think in Scala 3 I actually read that they, actually these guys had the courage, uh, these guys means us, to actually do something simpler and to throw a lot of stuff out and things like that. And we did that and hopefully we'll profit from that. <clears throat> so uh, we managed to make a lot of things simpler in the end. I believe we have quite a small language. Features compose well. It's also very easy to read. I think with the new syntax it's gotten a lot easier to read. And it's also becoming more opinionated because one of the things we noted was that there were just too many ways to write your code. So just to give you one example, uh, whether you write uh, alphanumeric method names in fix or with a dot. So in the future you're going to write them with a dot unless you declare the method infix to tell, let everybody know that this is an infix method. But otherwise, we sort of chosen a site now uh, because it's just essentially too, too many different variations for no game. <coughs> And uh, that's actually backed up by a slide that I've shown before in conferences that if you look at the size of grammar, so how many productions in your context-free grammar, then Scala is actually quite a small language. It's right here. That was done a couple, couple of years before. I don't think it has changed much, much except that I think the other languages have grown further. Um, yeah, so here you can see Python uh, at the time was a small language. I think it has grown lately with pattern matching and things like that. Haskell is smaller than Scala, but that doesn't count the 85 language official language extensions which essentially get paged in by, by every program. Here you have Scala, here you have Kotlin, Swift, Java 8, and then you go to C++, and interestingly enough, the biggest language is C Sharp. Uh, F Sharp, uh, I don't have on the thing, F Sharp would be about here, uh, C++, on, the, on that size thing, which is kind of weird because F Sharp is counts as a simple language, but it's actually quite large, whereas Scala uh, often counts as a more complicated language, but it's actually quite small. Uh, what that has to do with, I think, is essentially how many different concepts you have for different things, uh, which essentially give you a larger space, but maybe a more specialized space. So F Sharp has a lot of very specialized idioms for specialized things, type providers and quotation and things like that. Okay. But on the other hand, that if I would tell you, well, it's simple, uh, then I, I think I also need to address this point here that essentially if you look, the common impression of Scala is that it's, it's a very complex language, right? So that's what a lot of people say. It has that reputation. So people compare it with C++ and Rust in complexity, everything in the kitchen sink. But if you look at actually actual language sizes, then that's not backed up by that. Another often heard complaint, which I believe is related, is that Scala programmers are very hard to find, uh, which actually surprises me because we had many tens of thousands of people who successfully completed our online courses on Coursera, and uh, we are not the only ones. There's also the Rock, the JVM uh, courses, which are very popular. So there's, lo there's a lot of training. A lot of people get exposed to Scala, but nevertheless, uh, we say Scala programmers are hard to find. Why is that? On the other hand, uh, I think if you look at intro teaching, then Scala is actually a very popular and successful choice for intro to programming in universities. You, I mean, we know a dozen teachers who actually have made very good experiences with Scala as a first language. And it doesn't stop there. Scala was also considered to be a great first language for kids. So um, you probably remember this guy. He's now a, doc a doctoral student at Berkeley doing very interesting stuff. Shaddai. Also, there was Kojo, uh, the uh, essential environment for teaching uh, 
programming in, uh, in a college in India. Uh, so Scala was a language that was simple, uh, so that it was suitable for being uh, taught to kids. And I'm pained to say it somehow lost that reputation. So where are sort of the new kids, bright kids that learn Scala today? So what happened? So I think one is inevitable code bases grew, and with a growing code base, things get more complicated. We were sort of in the spring of life with the language where things, things are still easy. The other thing that happened is I think that traditional functional programming, which has been around for a long time, had a period where they discovered Scala as sort of the most industrial accepted vehicle in which you could do functional programming, and they imported a lot of idioms which are not that beginner friendly at least from my, from my perspective, they're not. Mostly that, uh, that, that essentially strand has left uh, the, the Scala community, but the effect lingers on. Uh, consequently, there were ideological battles, like suddenly half of the language was bad, out of bounds, never use var, never use exceptions, no object composition. Things got a lot more complicated. Uh, I believe also that what I've seen in industry, um, admittedly as being in university, my, my outlook is probably somewhat limited, but from talking to people, from looking at code bases, my, my reaction is that I believe many large code bases over type and over abstract, and therefore are harder for essentially have barriers for entry. And I also think they overuse DSLs, DSLs that create new syntax, uh, thereby fragmenting the user experience. Because suddenly, it's not good enough that you know Scala to join a company. You have to know ACA flavored Scala or type level flavored Scala, uh, these things which are essentially a lot more complicated. Of course, they're less, they're less documented. Uh, there are fewer courses. They're much more specialized. Uh, and they make it much harder to get up to speed. I think the other problem for beginners, at least, is that the entry-level tooling that developed uh, became too complicated in part. And I'm looking mostly at SPT here, uh, where I really think SPT for beginners is just, is just too hard. You don't, you don't want to, to, to force SPT on, on a beginning programmer. So you could say, well, most large code bases are a mess in any language. It doesn't really matter. Large code bases are a mess universally. But I think code bases written in Scala created some specific challenges which are barriers for entry. One challenge is that typically a Scala API is quite complex and exposes advanced language features such as higher kind of types and implicits. And that's for somebody who comes to it, it's new, it's unknown, and it's difficult. They have to get wrap their head around what these things are. I definitely agree there are good reasons why you want to have these things. Uh, they, they make it more flexible and things like that. But still, the challenge is that for the newcomer, they, they see all this stuff and say, whoa. Um, the, the other thing is that there are a lot of uh, complex design patterns. In the functional programming community, we typically say, well, design patterns, that's a Java thing. We, we are beyond that because our language is so much better. We don't need singletons and we have objects. We don't need visitors. We have pattern matching and all these things. But that's actually not true. We have essentially developed our own uh, range of design patterns, such as free monads, tagless finals, monad transformers, iterates. All these things are design patterns. They happen to be a lot more precisely typed than the old Java design patterns, because the Java design patterns actually came from Smalltalk, which was a dynamically typed language. So nobody really cared about types at the time. But uh, the design patterns, nevertheless, and people uh, have a hard time sometimes wrapping their heads around them. Uh, you sometimes have really humongous type class hierarchies. And all that essentially adds to barrier of entry for your applications. OK, so you can say, well, why have we fallen into that? pitfall and into that trap. Why the complexity? And I think the common belief is, uh, that I've heard many times from different people, is that complexity is inevitable since we need to solve two really hard problems. One is strong typing, make bad straights, uh, states unrepresentable. And the other is pure functional programming. Write your program in a purely functional way. So one common belief about elaborate typing is if 
Typing can guarantee absence of some class of runtime errors. Any amount of compile time complexity is justified. Essentially, I can have an unlimited budget to have very precise types if it can prevent some runtime errors in my program. I've heard people stating that to me verbatim. And I think it's wrong. Testing is a very good alternative in many cases. Uh, so we shouldn't disregard that. There's a, delimit there's a thing with diminishing returns, and at some point we're at the point where the returns are actually negative. So we have to essentially do the trade-off. What do we want to push in the types? What do we want to push into the assertions and the tests? An example from the Dotty compiler itself, it was just a design decision. So compilers are complicated beasts. They have a abstract syntax tree, which consists of many cases, so in our case, let's say between 40 and 50, something like that. And the, those cases get transformed down in a long pipeline to something which is much simpler. So over the time of the pipeline, the tree becomes typically smaller, either different or definitely some smaller. Some cases have been eliminated by so-called lowerings in previous phases. And it's a well-known problem how to represent that in the types. It has solutions. You can have essentially one AST type per phase, and it has some other design patterns where you can do that. But generally, people say it's a very hard problem. It essentially pollutes your code base quite a lot. So what we do in Dotty is none of that. We have a single tree type, and we just have post conditions, which say, well, essentially, if I, a phase eliminates a certain tree, then there's a post condition that I can state in the phase that gets checked in every subsequent phase that uh, that kind of tree node won't, won't, won't pop up again. Is it a problem? But for a compiler, I guess not. So uh, a compiler probably should have a test base large enough that we say there's a violation, my assertion will blow, definitely. So there's actually no win in actually putting that statically in the types, except essentially intellectual satisfaction that we managed to solve a really hard problem in the types. But it's actually, it's no good for the code. You could say, well, but, but, but what about exhaustivity of pattern matching? But it actually turns out in these phases that in, for most of the tree nodes, you do the same thing every time. Basically, you just recurse to the children, and you essentially push up, uh, recompose the results. So that's actually done by a general traverser that does that, where you just override the specific things. So we don't need to check the exhaustivity in the types, because essentially we have a design where we have a traverser that handles all uh, node counts from essentially from the first phase onwards. Okay, so what about pure functional programming? So another common belief that I've heard is that mutability is always bad and should be avoided uh, as much as you can and probably 100% in most cases. And I believe also that's wrong. It depends really on the situation. Local variables often actually help readability rather than uh, being a problem. Uh, and admittedly, global variables, so fields of globally reachable objects, are a lot more problematic, especially when aliased. But the, again, the problem is, where do we draw the line? So again, I show you an example of our compiler, which was like, kind of funny. So uh, we have a thing in the compiler called Levenstein distance, or edit distance. Uh, it's used in Scala 3 error messages. So if you write, for instance, xs.fatmap, blah, then it will say, well, it's not a member of list of int. Did you maybe mean xs.flatmap? Right, so the edit distance gives you the nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor of a misspelled string in, uh, in this case, the members of list of int. So uh, how do you do that algorithm? Well, you can look it up on the web, the pages of uh, the implementations of that distance in any language imaginable. But most of them are look like that, and that's also the current implementation in the uh, Scala compiler, in the current Scala compiler.c, the Scala 3.3 compiler. And it's really very simple. So basically what it is is you put some indices here, and then you fill an array, a two-dimensional array, with a diagonal that every cell gets computed from the cells uh, diagonally up and to the left and to the top of it. So that's what you do, sort of a wave front that travels from the left corner down. Uh, but of course, that's not purely functional. That uses a mutable array. So it's an intellectual challenge how to actually do a purely functional version of that uh, that is efficient. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not hard to essentially just have an array that gets recomputed every time you do that, but you want to make it efficient. So what we actually had in the same compiler before 
was this a purely functional implementation that's even shorter? So it's that thing here. And well, it looks okay. Nobody understood it really, but uh, uh, it looked okay until I actually said, well, this is weird. The, the proposed proposition it makes are actually very, very weird. So it should have proposed that and not the other thing. And then I actually went through that and I analyzed it and said, no, that's computing the wrong function. That's not Levenstein systems. It's just somebody that somebody grabbed from the web and it says, oh, cool. <laughs> we have Levenstein systems, purely functional. Let's take it. Let's not ask questions uh, how to understand it or things like that. <coughs> Another example that I've also seen in, in, in practice is graph traversal. So let's say we have a, a very simple thing where you have uh, nodes uh, that are labeled uh, each, uh, um, and you want to just go through and uh, compute the number of nodes reachable from your root G. Uh, so the typical thing is, well, you have a recursive thing, and you say, well, and you have a set of uh, nodes that you have already visited, because, well, it's a graph, so nodes can be uh, visited several times. And you say, if the set contains the node you're visiting, then you don't count it, and otherwise this should be a one. I'm sorry, that was a typo. Scene plus, like, plus equals one, so let's let add the node. And no, so, sorry, that's scene plus equals n. No, that you're, you're right. So the node is now in the set, and you go through the children. Uh, you recurse through the children. You take the sum, and you add one for the node. So that's OK. But again, it uses a mutable map, and aren't mutable collections bad? And in fact, I've seen that. I've seen people say, we don't do that here. We don't do mutable collections here. And they said, let's write it with an immutable collection. I leave it to you to say, well, how, how would this program look with an immutable collection? It would be pretty atrocious because essentially we have to thread the collection through as an argument as a, and as a result through every visit. So clearly that you say, well, of course you use a mutable collection. It's a local thing here. So th this program count is still a mathematical function. It just uses a local variable uh, in this case, a mutable collection for its functioning, for a clearer and more efficient, I should say, algorithm. So there's nothing wrong with that, but a lot of people have this sort of reaction. Another example, again, that, that was actually a Scala Matsuri conference I was, and which very much uh, surprised me at the time. Uh, that's a common operation, an option, right? You have an option. Uh, an optional value may be x, and you say, well, if it uh, is defined sum of x, then return op some operation on x, and if it's not defined, return a default. And the question I was asked at the conference, for this operation, should I use map and get or else? So that's what it would like then here. Or should I use forward? So that's what I uh, was, that's what it would like, would like here. What do you think? What should I use? Yeah? First one. The first one. Which is the first one, that or that? No, the match. That, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So I was saying, well, you use the match. It's 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 definitely the clearest, right, of of all the three. But people were very surprised that I said that. So I think one problem here is that Scala makes library code look like language, which is great, which means it gives you the seamless thing. But it's also something we have to watch out that it makes unnecessary abstraction, in this case, wrapping in these operations, uh, sometimes too tempting. So one has to walk, watch out for that. OK, so how can we sort of influence people to avoid complexity? One, one thing is. Use Scala 3. Uh, things are already a lot, of, uh, a lot simpler, I think, if you can. Uh, the other thing that is a useful tool that we have in the Scala 3 compiler sometimes is uh, an option called vProfile. So the, uh, the problem with Scala complexity is often that you don't see it. So sometimes you do see it. It's, it's complicated things. But often it's sort of hidden uh, in um, possibly very complicated implicit constructions that are done behind your back, or very complicated macro expansions. And you don't see these things in source necessarily, but they, they still add to the program complexity. And also, in particular, they add to, the, to your compile times. So for you, if you run your Scala program to the compiler, how, many, how fast is it? Is it fast enough? Is it? Uh, so if I run it, 
in, let's say, the Scala compiler itself, in a warm compiler, I get about 4,000 lines of per second on my four-year-old Mac, uh, which is fast enough for me. Uh, if I run that, uh, SPT takes a bit away. If you run it with SPT, SPT is actually quite, uh, quite resource hungry with that. But that's sort of what you get. But uh, I guess if everybody got even a thousand lines a second, nobody would complain so much about compiler speed. So that probably tells me that a lot of people get a lot less. And um, the reason why a lot people get a lot less is essentially that without them seeing it, your program generates a huge amount of code that all also has to pass the compiler, but that you don't actually see in the source. The code is maybe implicit constructions or macro expansion, typically, those two. Sometimes, very rarely, sometimes it's that the inferred types just get huge. So that also can happen. But in my experience, the two primary culprits are implicit expansion and macro expansion. So what you have here is essentially some uh, source, uh, some measures for complexity as the compiler sees it. So you get for every file in your project, you get the number of lines. Well, that you can do count with C-lock, of course. So uh, non-white space lines. You get the number of tokens, so w words that the compiler inferred. That's typically related to lines, but maybe it's not always exact. And then you get the number of so-called tasty chunks. So this thing has been normalized uh, so that you say that in a moderately to in a essentially low to moderately t complex program, uh, one source line contains to, uh, co um, corresponds to one tasty chunk. I think a tasty chunk is 50 bytes of tasty, which is about the same as, this, as the typical size of a source line. So our tasty rep representation is about as large as source. And then you can essentially see where you are and what the complexity is. And then uh, if you run it with minus V profile, minus details, then you also get <coughs> the N, in this case, five most complex so methods that produce essentially internally the most code so that, that you see here. So here you see something fairly well behaved. So there's one thing which is an outlier high. If you look it up, then highlighting is actually was actually a fairly small file. So yeah, small files with high complexity are, of course, not as problematic as large files with high complexity. And what it was, it was a file that, uh, that uh, defined a lot of case classes. So case classes also actually generate quite a lot of code per case class, and that pushed up the complexity in this case. But I think it's a useful thing to do if you have a code base and you say, why does it compile so slow uh, that you run it through that and you probably see, see quite, quite well where, where the, the time is probably spent. Um, other tips to uh, avoid complexity would be prefer simple tooling, and I think we have made a lot of progress there. I'm really, I really like Scala CLI, which is in, uh, about to be hopefully standardized to be the standard Scala runner. So hopefully at some point in the future it will be just called Scala and not Scala iPhone CLI. There's a SIP uh, Scala improvement proposal for that, and. The other thing one can do is try to use simple libraries or libraries that are as complicated as you need them. Not everybody needs to be reactive all of the time. Uh, sometimes you just need a simple synchronous request and it's, it's much, much simpler. One problem with that is that it's actually pretty non-trivial to find them because they're sort of dispersed over there. And that's something that uh, we are trying to change now. Uh, with the Scala toolkit. Uh, so Christoph uh, Romanowski, he will uh, talk more in this conference about that effort. Uh, the Scala toolkit should be essentially a set of entry-level libraries that are simple and approachable. And uh, the idea is not to create new ones, uh, because we actually have a lot of battle-tested good libraries. The idea is more to curate libraries that actually would fit that bill. So we are cooperating with these maintainers to compose a set of libraries that are already battle-tested. Battle and we're starting very, very small, I think, four libraries. Uh, so the focus should be it's suitable for scripting, prototyping, and newcomer friendly. Uh, and uh, we don't really put uh, uh, any focus 
on advanced features like uh, parallelism or uh, asynchronicity or things like that, which doesn't mean that these things are not necessary. Of course, they are in some situations. But the point is, in many situations, they are not. And then we shouldn't have the burden to actually uh, interfacing with these things. So the idea is to make these libraries easily accessible and to document them in one place. So the way it looks is, uh, in this case, it's done with Scala CLI. You just put a using clause toolkit, and then essentially you have everything. Uh, no, no need to have an SPT build script. So this one uses STTP, which is the HTTP libraries. They also uh, plan to be libraries for JSON, testing, and uh, a lot more. So the idea is that. Uh, Scala is a language that's well suited for prototyping and big applications. And the, to find the tools for the simple prog uh, problems, we hope that Scala Toolkit will help and that it also will make Scala more open for newcomers. Um, I'm, having, I'm switching gears uh, now uh, to uh, we'll go in, in a couple of slides to another presentation. Before I do that, I just stay with that. Uh, the, I would like to advertise the Scala survey, which has been out for a couple of days. So we want to essentially know from you where you are, uh, what are your opinions about various topics in Scala land. So here's a, a, a barcode, and uh, here's the address, Scala survey 2022, virtuslab.com. Should take four to 12 minutes and is anonymous and will release a summary of the results. So that has been set up by a joint Scala Center and Virtus Lab. Good. Staying with complexity, um, one thing which definitely is a hard challenge and drives off complexity is effect typing. So effect typing has been in the functional programming community almost synonymous with monadic effect typing. So essentially, you have effect monads, and that's what your effect typing is. And that's actually quite a large source of complexity. And it's the larger, the more fine-grained your effects are. What I often say, having one monad in your program is great. It's no problem at all. Once you start to mix them, uh, it, gets, it gets problematic. No matter whether you do monad transformers or tagless final or free monads, they all are out of very, very heavyweight uh, program constructs and patterns. So the alternatives, what alternatives exist? Well, one would be, let's not care about that. Let's just say, well, we don't need, really need to push everything in the types. Let's use weaker typing. So that means no checked exceptions, no tracking of side effects, uh, or I.O., or things like that, which is basically what Scala Toolkit programs do. So to say, well, we, we, we are synchronous, and we are a model where we allow effects, of course, not effects random and uh, just out of, out of fun. We still minimize them, but we don't really, uh, it's not our intention and ambition to track every one of these things, which I think for now is a perfectly good uh, position to have, and one which essentially the software industry at large, of course, has. In basically, all languages except pure FP work that way, and it's been very successful. Nevertheless, it's still a bit rankling to say, well, do we really have to choose between exact typing and uh, simple programs? Uh, isn't there something we could have simpler type systems that let us talk about? effects and these things. And that is a, a thing that I have been, uh, I'm starting to work on. I've been working for some time on the research side. So I want to e explain to you a little bit what we have been doing there and what we plan to do in the future, to have essentially simpler, hopefully simpler type systems for effects and also resources. So I'm going to switch the screen now. OK, so um, the, uh, it's about a research project that uh, we are just uh, about to launch, uh, uh, Five Year Horizon, uh, fairly large funding. Uh, that, that, by the way, is the Rolex Learning Center on EPFL. So that's, a, that's a, a, a basically our library. Um, um, and the project is called Caprese. Uh, 
What Caprese stands for is Capabilities for Resources and Effects. And it starts with the observation that static typing has largely lagged behind when it goes, comes to essentially capturing resources and effects. Big exception is essentially monadic effects where essentially people pushed the envelope on effects quite a bit, but not without frictions. On the research side, you have that, but you have also hundreds of other papers uh, on many, many different approaches, but uh, no large-scale adoption yet. So the core insights, what we want to do is that we can re describe resources and effects both as capabilities and that we want to uh, capture re retained capabilities in types. We want to track them in types. So I'm going to explain to you uh, at a high level what this means. But before we get to that, it's good to actually be precise what we mean by resources and effects. So let's start with resources. So resources are values uh, that are available only with certain restrictions. For instance, lifetime. I can use a value only during a certain time, let's say a file until it's closed. Once the file is closed, it's no longer available. That's a resource. Sharing, uh, that maybe a value is available only to one thread and it can't be freely shared between threads because that would give you a race condition. Thread local value, values would be sharing. Or quantity, that I can essentially only have a single copy of this thing uh, and not multiple copies. So examples are variables, regions of memories, file handles, channels, database and network connections, and many others. So that's resources. Uh, what about effects? So effects are, uh, in the literature, aspects of computation beyond shapes of inputs and outputs of functions that we want to track in types. So in that sense, effect types is basically almost a misnomer because we said an effect system, or, but effect types is okay. But if you say effect systems, then it's strictly speaking false because an effect system is something that is essentially beyond your types. And of course in Scala or Haskell we do, we push that in, into the types, uh, which has certain advantages and also certain disadvantages. So what are typically effects? Well, updating a variable, throwing an exception, doing I.O., or also, I think, suspending a computation. So async, uh, waiting for some uh, event to happen is an effect. So if you look at effects and uh, resources in programming, then you could say, in theory, it's basically everything that is down in actually computers that you abstract from, that you don't have in the high level theory of lambda calculus. In lambda calculus, every value is available forever to anyone. And of course, there are no side effects. It's all pure functional programming. Whereas computers have all these things. And that's also reflected in programming languages. So they're very high functional programming languages, Haskell, Scala, a bit less, uh, that essentially are up here that have very few resources Sources, typically that try to either avoid completely or uh, to a large degree possible uh, talking about resources and effects. And then you have languages like here, C, C++ imperative ones where essentially everything you do is a side effect. Uh, so uh, the imperative languages work by essentially having side effects. And uh, then you have essentially languages like Java, Swift, or Go, which is pretty much the same thing. Like in Java, yes, you can have expressions, but uh, most things you can't even have a, 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 a a pattern match uh, in an expression, or not yet. I think it will come uh, at some point. Uh, I think it's in preview now. So, uh, so you have this spectrum here. And, but there's another dimension which is interesting to look at, and it's to, to what degree are effects and resources actually tracked at compile time? And uh, there the answer is, well, uh, not really that much. So there are some exceptions like Haskell. Maybe I should put, push Haskell a little bit over there because in principle you can get a lot of effects, resources less so, I guess, in Haskell. Except if you go to linear types, linear, yeah, linear Haskell is, is further over there. In Java you could say, well, you have checked exceptions. That's at least one kind of uh, effect that gets handled in a type system. In other languages like Scala, Go, uh, basically nothing at all, not from the language. <laughs> Maybe sometimes the libraries give it to you. But there's one exception uh, uh, there where, uh, which is essentially for 
memory effects, uh, Rust gives you very, very fine grain trucking. So Rust is basically over here, which is, uh, uh, and, but Rust, despite its functional trappings, that means it has a lot of modern abstractions that you also find in Scala or Haskell or things like that. It was influenced quite a lot from, from these things. It's still an imperative language. You can't really do high order functions very well in Rust. Uh, can't, you, for instance, you can't do futures in the typical thing because for, for in order to do any, um, any degree of higher, higher order functional programming, you need a garbage collector, and it was Rust's choice not to have a garbage collector. So it is an imperative language at heart. So the question is, well, um, if we also want to do a fine-grained tracking of resources and effects, but do so at a higher level, what do we end up with? And in fact, we, there, there are many, uh, have been over the years, many uh, experiments and proposals. Uh, linear Haskell is one. Uh, there have been projects called Singularity, Mezzo, alias types, can count algebraic effects up there as well. But again, none of them really has caught on in a major way yet. So that's basically what we want to do. The project is called Capraise, Mobilities for Resources and Effects. Uh, Okay, so I've told you what resources and what effects are. What are capabilities? So the idea is a capability is uh, essentially just a unforgeable value, an object that I pass you, uh, that, that I give you. It's really in the sense of object capabilities, which has been with us since the times of small talk. So a very, very old thing, which nevertheless is quite popular in operating systems, security architectures, and so on. And the idea is that we can model effects with capabilities. In fact, we have the safer exceptions extension of uh, Scala, which you can enable when you, as an experimental extensions, where these things literally hold. So you can write T throws E, which really looks like an effect. So the function returns on T and it might throw an E. Or, uh, and that actually gets translated by essentially just massaging this, this type, it's an infix type and so on, it gets, gets translated to that, which says, well, the f, it's a function that returns a t, but in order to do that, it needs a capability which says can throw the exception e. So can throw is a capability. And the, the, the two views are, of course, in a sense, equivalent. You can express that you uh, essentially throw an exception either this way or this way. It means the same thing. Uh, but it actually turns out that for certain things, the capability point of view is much, much better. And in particular, when it comes to what we call effect polymorphism. So to understand if effect polymorphism, it's good enough to just look at map, which in a sense is the simplest function. We can explain a lot of things with, by just looking at map alone. So here you have map on list of A. It takes a function from A to B and returns a list of B. If you look at it with a traditional effectful way, then it would basically look like that. So the function needs another effect parameter. That's the effect that it has. And uh, it uh, then returns, uh, it takes a function from A to B that has the effect E, and it returns a list of B that has the same effect that it calls. And if you look at it monadic, then instead of the E, there would be an F. That's essentially the effect monad that you wrap around things. But it's basically very similar. OK, so the problem, that might look OK, but it really isn't. Uh, because the problem is map is not alone. Map is the, your prototypical function. In and uh, Most uh, functions are higher order. They take other functions. In an object-oriented program, essentially your parameters are objects. And objects have methods. So, uh, and those methods can have effects. So it's exactly the same thing. So most functions are actually more complicated than, than map in the sense that they have more than one of these parameters. So you need to have more than one effect variable, which you always have to mix. So that's basically where uh, uh, the problem why effect systems haven't caught on, I believe. So if you look at it with capabilities, then it actually works. So with capabilities, that would be the type, which you notice is exactly the same type as we started with. It's the old type of map. Well, something there, there must be some sleight of hand. How, 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 how could you do that, right? How could it be the same type? Well, the trick is that we say, well, this type now, A, double arrow B, is the type of impure functions 
and an impure function can capture a capability in its environment. So lambdas, they can essentially read some free variables and then take some parameters. And reading the free variables, that's why they're called closures, right? So they close over the free variables. And essentially, these functions can also close over variables that are capabilities that we pass into them with uh, implicit parameters usually. So if a function captures a capability, that means it can essentially have certain effects, and that makes it an impure function. So what Scala now has, Scala 3 in, in another experimental extension, is another type A single arrow B of pure functions. So notice that this is incredible foresight. We knew for 20 years we wanted to do that. So we reserved the single function arrow, which is used in Haskell and ML for pure functions where it should be. And we used the double function arrow for impure functions. No, just joking. But, but it, it, it actually works out rather well. Okay, so you could say, well, okay, if that's all there is to it, that looks too simple, right? And indeed, there is a catch. So the catch is that capabilities in this sense really are resources, so they have limitations on their usage. So here we have a, a slightly more uh, complete example. Uh, we say our effect is throwing an exception, so we have an exception too large and a function that throws it. So uh, if x is too large, then it throws the exception. And then we map this function over a list, and we catch the exception. And uh, if the exception gets caught, we return nil. OK, so what uh, this, this system for safe exception actually does is the compiler will generate here a capability to throw this too large exception. And it creates that capability. It can create that capability because it's caught here, uh, because I, there is actually a handler for that. So what actually happens after behind the scenes is that the compiler will essentially pass this new can throw too large capability into the function f. So here you see the function f that gets called to map is that. That's the closure. The function f sees this kind of throw capability. Map doesn't need to know about it. OK. But the problem is that capability has limited lifetime. When the try exits, the capability has gone away as well. So nobody handles the exception anymore. So what can we do there? So here we have something which is problematic. I just changed the example very, very slightly. I write instead of xs.mapf, I write xs.iterator.mapf. And now things go wrong, because when I then do it.next, then at that point, uh, the function f gets called on the map. And at that point, the try is no longer active. So I have an exception that gets propagated until program prompt, an unhandled exception. So of course, that kind of program we should rule out statically. That should be an illegal program. Otherwise, our type safety is worth nothing. So the question is, how can we rule out that program statically and still accept the original map program? And there, the idea is we want to track in a type which capabilities can be captured by its instances. So the idea now is normally a type, you say, well, it's sort of, it has the for, of a closure, let's say a function, well, here, here are the input parameters, and here are the output parameters. And we say, well, and also, by the way, as some of its free values, it might refer to these capabilities. So that's essentially a third dimension of what we track in a type. So the idea to do that is to introduce a so-called capturing type which consists of a type T and a capture set of capabilities. So those are capabilities. And it means that, well, it's whatever T is, and it can also essentially retain references to these capabilities. If there is no capture set, it means the type is pure. It can't reference any capability, so it can't do nothing. Uh, and what is a capability then? Well, the capability, we say, is a reference uh, of uh, a variable, just like an object capability, but not any variable, but it must be a reference to a variable of a capturing type with a non-empty capture set. So if we tracked all three variables, that would just be too verbose and too fragile. I mean, you, you want to change it in your program, because what variables get captured without changing your types. But by this construction, we restrict this, these things that we need to track to capabilities. So what that means is that every capability 
must have another capability in its capture set, so something like that. And you could say this other capability or sets of capabilities give it a, the authority to essentially do that. So every capability gets its authority from some other more sweeping capability which it captures. So there must then be a root capability from, from which every other capability is derived. And indeed there is one which is essentially sort of the, which we call star, is the universal capability. So what this is, is really a type systematic description of the family object capability model, which so far really has only been used in typically dynamic, dynamic, dynamically typed languages, uh, where you say, what is that model? Well, you pass capabilities as parameters to function. That's just a normal parameter for us, or rather an implicit parameter, because we don't want to write essentially passing these capabilities all of the time. So the only thing that we need to, in addition to, to that, is to say, well, if I return a closure, then what capabilities could it hang on to? And that's precisely what the type system does. So we did a, a calculus. Uh, which is sort of a mini, mini language and with a lot of Greek and rules. Uh, and then you have to prove that this whole thing is sound, uh, which is a, uh, a, lot of, a lot of work. So essentially you have to say that the type system keeps its promises, uh, that when it says the program is okay, that it will not crash with certain errors at runtime. So this thing is called capture calculus. It's a formalization of a minimal call language with statically typed capabilities. And we also have now a language extension, um, which is uh, enabled with a, a Y option, YCC, CC for capture checking. Um, in, uh, in the Scala 3 compiler where you can try out these things. It's still very, very bleeding edge, so don't, uh, don't uh, be disappointed if there are bugs or things like that, but the, way it's, 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 the first steps are there. So, so far it's very promising in the small, but the question is, can we scale it up? And that's where the research essentially, what the research project is about. So what we want to do is essentially a project in four areas, core extensions, infrastructure, and applications. So in the core, we essentially want to build on this capture calculus and uh, want to see, essentially want to study it further, want to see whether we can extend it to more language constructs, in particular objects and classes and stuff like that and also uh, whether we can formalize type inference for this. Um, so we have a prototype capture checker, but you have to somehow be able to f relate that to a formal algorithm and prove the algorithm correct. Uh, the second step then is concrete uh, areas of resources and exceptions and uh, in particular the one we want to look at uh, primarily is memory safety. So essentially think Rust uh, and, and concurrency. Uh, so essentially and, and the links between the two. And the next step would be the infrastructure to actually put the, all that into Scala. So where the question is, well, is that actually better than monadic effect typing? Are capture annotations lightweight enough to be used widely in practice? So far, my hunch is yes, but it's, it's, it's really, I have to admit, it's just a hunch. It's, it's, it's not absolute truth. We have to work and find out how, how these things scale. Uh, can cap capture checking be made efficient enough for large code bases? We have to find out. So far, our largest test program is maybe 600 lines, maybe like that. So let's see when we have 6 million lines, how it would, how, how, how it would perform then. Can error diagnostics be made clear enough to be intelligible for non-experts? Right now, the answer is the current state of the thing is definitely not. So a lot more engineering is needed for that. And also, very importantly, can we migrate and interoperate with existing code? And that's actually where I'm quite hopeful because the brilliant thing with capabilities is they can cheat, they let you cheat. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. So um, in the capability model, normally you say uh, a capability-based language is essentially a language that doesn't have global variables. So capabilities can't be global variables. That means every capability you get, you must get as a parameter from someone else. And your main program will have essentially the total capability or authority of your program. And then you can distribute it, but you don't get it from a side channel. That's the capability thing. But the point is that in order to migrate existing code, we could cheat. We could say, well, initially, you can get the capability to do anything 
from PREDEF or uh, the standard import, which of course would be toothless, uh, but you can unimport it and thereby already have some small island which is scalability safe. And then in the next step, what we, we could say, well, now the scalability is actually taken away, but you can still import it from unsafe or something like that. So you can, the idea is you can, you, we, you might be able to actually migrate smoothly from current unsafe code to future safe code by essentially playing with imports. And the final thing is looking at applications. So the very interesting applications in language-based security, uh, including protocols for various hardware extensions that enforce uh, capability-based systems and security. Uh, there are very interesting areas of efficient computing, uh, both low power and high performance, where essentially you want to essentially be able to talk in, a, in very precise terms about memory that you use. Uh, distributed systems, of course, is interesting because now you have resources that are node specific. So you have certain things that you want to keep on a node and other things that essentially could, uh, could, might, could, could move out, but maybe not directly. So that's another kind of resource. And another one is actually informal methods where uh, you could say, well, even Let's say non term well, definitely a lot of the functions you use in your formulas, they all need to be pure. You need to, you need to already say that, but they need to be pure and total. So you, you, can't, you can't really have non-termination in functions that you use in your proofs. So that's another kind of effect system. So um, the outlook, I think, if this works, then I guess we can solve a lot of problems in uh, programming uh, that have been standing for a long time. One is uh, effect polymorphism, getting flexibility without the overhead. The other is called uh, what color is your function problem, maybe you've heard of that, which is basically how can we mix synchronous and asynchronous code without duplicating a lot of functions in our program. Uh, that's essentially just another uh, version of effect polymorphism, really. Uh, the uh, combining manual allocation and automatic GC and fearless concurrency on a, on a higher level than Rust. So it, if that works, then it would lead to exciting new ways to model functional and imperative programming no longer as two absolutes, but essentially as different ends of a spectrum, which is sort of what I've been saying the whole talk. We should see it as a spectrum and we should aim for the right middle. And this would sort of give you the type theoretic underpinnings for that, you could say. Thank you. That was all I had, and I'm happy to take questions. Should I go out the... No. no? Okay. Many large code bases over type and over uh, abstract. Is there evidence for that and how did you get the evidence? Uh, I got it from talking to people who essentially said, uh, we have pieces in our uh, code stack that nobody wants to touch, touch, and they're really hard. And uh, why that's the thing? And often, very often, it pointed to that. Uh, essentially, things like, you have a simple command line tool that takes maybe a second to run and you plaster it full with async and futures. No need for that. Uh, things like using an immutable collection for a graph traversal, which I've shown you, that, that's, that's also a typical, typical thing. And you, I, I think, so the answer is, I guess it's all anecdotal, but I believe also, and now I'm sort of be, being a bit think that to say, we have to realize that the Scala community has this problem and has a problem. So just saying you don't have evidence is really closing your eyes and saying we can continue like as, as we continued before. And I, I really think that that's a sure recipe for niche status. You can you can maybe continue a little bit further the way you did, but you can't break out. You can't really become uh, a lot more accepted and popular and easy to get into than what we've seen now. That's my personal opinion. Okay.
Zio seems to be getting some traction among advanced developers. However, it has a huge barrier of entry for newcomers. Do you think that the expected benefits of pure FP justify going this route? Um, well, again, it's, it's essentially a spectrum. I'm sure there are lots of applications that benefit from Zio, uh, the, the, uh, essentially the, the, the framework Zio. It's a framework that is very good at certain things, high performance reactive things. If, the, if it fits into that framework, then it can be very good. But not all programs are in that framework, of course. Let's say, let's uh, take the whole thing of data science and things like that. There's definitely no async uh, or reactive programming anywhere in there. So it is a framework for a special use case and that means I, I think also that there must be things outside of Zio that beginning programmers learn and not just beginning but maybe they stay with that. So if you if you learn Scala to do data science then will, you will probably never hit hit the, the, these things and you'll never hit well, that's, that's, that's actually a problem uh, in terminology, I think. So if you do data science with Spark, then you do pure functional programming. There are mathematical functions. You don't have monads, you don't have effect typing, because they're not needed. But it's pure functional programming. But we have this sort of terminology that pure functional programming must be something that, that has these things. And it's actually not true. So, yeah. With the new effects work, would it be possible to implement a non-blocking version of future of A to A that does not depend on Project Loom and works across J JVM, JS, and native? Um, poss well, yeah, well, it depends how much engineering you, you, you're going to put into that. But it's actually one a thing we want to look at. Uh, so. Um, so there is essentially, I, I think Loom holds a lot of promise, and I'm really looking forward to the time we can all use it in a, in a standard uh, uh, Java, Java environment. Um, but the, if you don't have Loom, like on native, then what do you do instead? So you could do your own uh, coroutine uh, virtual thread library, uh, and I think that's definitely a possible route. Uh, the other possibility that's also possible and maybe should be looked at would be to uh, generalize async. So as you know, we have async await already in, in Scala, uh, where uh, essentially you, that works as a macro by rewriting or as a compiler phase. I think the latest is a compiler phase by rewriting your code into a state machine that can suspend. And the problem is that it is local. So essentially all, you, all the awaits have to be in the scope of the async. And it's very strict, so it can't even be in a, in a closure that's in the same scope. So it ha really has to be in the same sort of code that you can reach by the same state machine. And the question is, well, if you wanted to generalize that, then uh, we'd have to do some larger scale code rewriting, something like suspend functions in Kotlin, right? But suspend functions also introduce color is your function problem, and then suddenly a, pro a function is suspended or not suspended, and you have to choose your sides. Which one is it? And you can't have functions that work with suspend functions or non-suspend, or you inline these functions. That's the Kotlin solution to it. Inline a lot, and then, then you can essentially specialize them on these things. Um, possibly with, with uh, capabilities, we can do a better job that we can say we can do an analysis, and if something has an argument that has the suspend capability, then essentially you must translate this thing itself to a state machine. So I think with the capability system, we could maybe have sort of a program-wide specialization for async and, and, and synchronous that is sort of smoother than what we have now. But that's a research question. Or maybe we'll just do virtual threads everywhere. One problem of that is, of course, in JavaScript, there, are, there will probably not be virtual threads. So that's, that's for, for JS, we will, we will have a problem here. What is the future of futures in Scala? Um, good question. Um, I don't know. I, I think future is actually a horse for, for lots of applications, right? So uh, 
whenever you need something in the future, we I use a future I use I use a future in the compiler to say well I need to just compute something on the side and uh, when I wait I have a future for these things. So I think it definitely won't won't go away. Whether uh, we will have sort of programs that exclusively use futures for everything async or virtual threads or so on remains to be seen. How is def F T throws E better than similar syntax in Java. Uh, the benefits come, of course, from uh, how, how you would define map in Java. You can't. So, uh, or you would do it with these effect parameters, but nobody does that because it's too complicated. So the benefit is you can actually have functions that are effect polymorphic, that work with things that throw or not. What people do in Java for that is typically you, uh, you, uh, you hide the exception, and then you re-throw it exception, and then you re and undermines uh, lots of things, type safety, and, 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 and so on. But essentially, Java has to jump through a lot of hoops to make it work, which we won't, we won't have to do in, in Scala. How do you think Scala 3 adoption can be improved to big problem? I see is lack of IDE support. It's going to me become due to lack of idea support. Um, well, I think, so, I personally use VS Code and Metals, and uh, I'm, I'm happy with it, generally. Uh, IntelliJ IDEA, I think they're working hard on improving. Uh, they're getting there. I don't know exactly where they are right now. Maybe I get some, some feedback of whether it's, it's worth already uh, uh, giving them a try, or whether it, it, it would need some more time. But it's a matter of time. I think that they, they, they definitely will get there. That's all we had, it seems. Okay, thank you again. Firing retro rock. Roger, Matt. Ready to eject.